Dr. Johnson, among the, I guess, improvements we've seen with the rollout in the state, um, we have not yet seen a big bridge in the gap of the racial inequities, the vaccine distribution to black and brown residents. Um, to what do you attribute that to? And is there a better way that we can be going about this? Well, in the beginning, there was an issue with vaccine hesitancy that's based upon the, the uh, historical mistrust that existed between black and brown communities and, and medicine and science in general. And of course, everyone knows about the things that occurred with Tuskegee and that sort of thing. And so that was one of the first things we had to do. We have to begin to convince people that this was not another experiment that was going to adversely affect uh, black and brown communities. Then we had to present some role models. And so I went out and gave some talks. I actually was one of the first people vaccinated and made a big deal of that in the press. And so a number of other people did it. We went to, and I went to churches and other people did that same thing as well. And so we moved from resistance to vaccine to a point where people were, were ready to get it. Then you run into an issue of availability. So access has always been an issue in black and brown communities because there are fewer healthcare facilities, there are other types of problems. And in this particular case, it was not only were there physical issues with facilities not being available, but then we have a mechanism of signing up for vaccines that required computers and the internet. And we're focusing on people who are senior citizens who are not only less likely to have access, but less likely to even know how to do it. And so with this very complex way of the, determining how to get vaccines, then you have even, even more of a barrier. And so we are gradually beginning to overcome those barriers. The, we'll find now in the most recent surveys that the acceptance of the vaccine is going up in black and brown communities. There's a greater demand for it. Uh, we are beginning to find better ways of making it accessible like uh, doing vaccines at people's homes or taking mobile units out or doing it in churches or other community centers. So it's, we're getting there, but it has been a problem. And, you know, I, I can't help but observe that this is not new. We knew this uh, and there should have been better planning right from the beginning, but I won't, I won't beat that dead horse. Well, right. I mean, you've got, you've got folks driving across the yeah. state. I mean, top to bottom, bottom to top. Yeah. Yeah. Um, something that really is only afforded to folks with a car, folks who have yeah. the money to pay yeah. the tolls and get up the turnpike or down the turnpike to do right. so. Right. right. You're absolutely right. And, and, we, and there, there are no factors that are contributing to this that we didn't already know. And, and many of us who knew these things said, well, there needs to be better planning. Now, to the state's credit, uh, we didn't know how many vaccines were coming. The rollout across the country uh, was one that was done without a lot of rationale associated with it. So it is what it is, and we are, we are now uh, resolving some of those problems and we're moving ahead. Well, since you touched on that, Dr. Johnson, the fact that the J&J &J supply is going to dwindle, at least for the time being. Mm -hmm. um, does that concern you, knowing that uh, it is being used in some of these areas because it's easier to distribute, right. easier to move? Of course, it's a concern because we want to get people vaccinated as quickly as possible. Every day that you lose means someone's going to get infected and someone's going to die. So, yes, it is a concern, uh, but um, it looks as if uh, we're going to, I mean, it's, it's probably going to put a week delay, maybe a week and a half delay in, in the process. And so I think it's, it's not going to be a, a huge problem, but it's going to be a problem. Then we had the CDC come out mm -hmm. and say racism is a public health threat. This is something right. that's been studied for years that came to a no surprise to those who've been studying it for years that where you live can also can often determine your health outcomes. What did you make of that? Well, as you may know, I served on several panels at the CDC that actually said that several years ago, and we made some recommendations, you know, the things that can be done in education, things that can be done in housing, health disparities lead to greater death. COVID-19 was a great example of how that works out. More people who were black and brown died and had more serious illness and are more likely to be in hospitals because of these issues. And so 
you know, if, if there is one good thing that comes out of this experience we've had over the, the last year is that everyone now understands how all of these issues, these social determinants of health, actually have a real adverse effect on people. And, and hopefully it will, we will, we'll, we'll get around it because there are things that can be done. If we improve housing, if we improve neighborhoods, if we improve education, all of these things will improve those outcomes. But, but, but racism is a threat to, to health outcomes and uh, it's, it's a real effect. Yeah, I wanna just shift gears to ask you about this request that Pfizer has made for an emergency use authorization of its vaccine in 12 to 15 year olds. I know you work with this group. Um, could this help bridge some of the divide? And what kind of questions are you getting from patients and families about it? Well, interestingly, I'm, the question I'm getting is when can our kids get vaccinated? Uh, and so the use of vaccines in this age group is not unusual. You know, all kids get vaccines and they're required vaccines to, to go to school. And so the idea that they get a vaccine for children or vaccines to be required in children is actually in many ways more acceptable than it is in adults because we vaccinate our children. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we have a good uh, reason to believe that children are one of the reservoirs for, for the infection. So during the, last, uh, during the last year, I've diagnosed many of my patients with COVID-19. They weren't sick. They got the test because their parents or their friends had it. And so we did the test and they were sitting here, no fever, no sore throat, nothing, but they had a positive test. So it's not a surprise um, that, uh, that this group needs it. And I think that if we, we start vaccinating this group, uh, we'll find that it will help us more quickly get to a period of time we have, have heard in the end of it. Do you expect that once we're able to flesh out more of the data, because adolescents weren't getting tested, it was tough to get tested at all early mm -hmm. on, um, mm -hmm. that we're going to find some really interesting um, subsets of information about that age group? Well, I think so. I think that one of the things we're going to find is, is higher infection rates than we expected. The other thing is that the idea that, that kids are not affected severely is also going to be one that has a lot of questions. Uh, we are seeing uh, at, in our children's hospitals that the that adolescents are coming in and sick, not at, certainly not at the level that we see with uh, with senior citizens, but they do have adverse effects. Now, again, if you have a large population of people, and even if you have a small percentage infected and small percentage who are going to have um, um, ad, uh, bad outcomes. That you're going to have it there, so it's not so it's not a big big surprise, uh, but it's not a benign disease in children. It is it can have, and then the other thing is we don't know whether or not these long haul symptoms that uh, people have are, and we don't know how that's going to play out in children as well. Dr. Robert Johnson, great to chat with you this morning. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Glad to do it.